Hey, my brothers and sisters of God Squad Church, B's the chaplain here, also known as Bizush. Um, I've been invited to deliver the message today. I'm really excited about it because we're talking about defeating darkness. We're continuing our series. Now, a few weeks back, we had Pastor AJ talking about defeating the darkness of unforgiveness. And then previously, we had Pastor Susie talking about defeating the darkness of the world around us. Today, I want to talk about defeating the darkness within. And not only that, defeating the darkness within once and for all, and how we can actually do that. Because um, we go through a lot of darkness, we experience a lot of darkness. When we need to fight the battles that wage war in our minds, when we need to face the demons that plague us in spiritual warfare that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis, or when we need to deal with situations that make us feel that we're trapped or we're in bondage. Have you ever felt that? However, perhaps you're probably going through a season now that you're probably thinking, I shouldn't be here or I shouldn't be coming back to this place or I thought I was past this or why am I still struggling with this or why am I still stuck in this same situation or why am I still a slave to this? Can you, can you resonate with any of these things? because there is hope. And today we're going to talk about where that hope is found. Let me reassure you that there is hope and that hope is found in Jesus Christ. The darkness that you are in can be defeated once and for all. And today we're going to celebrate how this has been accomplished and how we can continue to celebrate that it's already been done. Let's actually open up uh, before we start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I just want to say thank you so much that we have the opportunity to celebrate victory found in you. Now, at this moment, there might be people who are randomly here, but we know that it's not random. We know that you've handpicked the people to hear this message today because they might be experiencing spiritual bondage. They might be experiencing circumstances that they need you to set them free from. So, Lord, I pray that today this message be a message of hope, love, mercy, compassion, grace, and revival, revival in their lives. Lord, I finally pray that through the arms and the eyes and the fumbling of my words, Lord, I pray that you capture every single word and by the power of the Spirit, make those words be words of transformation, of hope, of, um, of just love. And finally, Lord, I pray that you take this message as an offering and your will be done with it. I ask this all in your loving name. Amen. Now, God Squad Church, you know that I'm, I'm really hype about this. So let me see you get some hype in the chats by putting amen and just throwing it up there. Um, we're going to go straight into it. This is how we can have the assurance of the, of the victory found in Jesus Christ. There's a Bible passage that I want to bring up. And the first one, we're going to go through the Bible. We're going to claim promises in the Word of God today. We're going to plan, claim promises over the, uh, over the darkness that might be in our lives, in the battles that we're currently facing. We're going to claim victory in the name of Jesus today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, and take this message as a message of hope. It says, This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings that we did, yet he did not sin. And that is not a way, or this is not a message to set us up to fail. It's not a thing to say, well, Jesus did it. He's our high priest, so we are expected to do it as well. No, this gives us hope to say that, as Jesus said, in this world, there will be trials. In this world, there will be tests. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said this, not to brag, but to say, because I've done it and there is power in me for you as well. That's where the hope is found. And we're gonna, I'm going to share with you a story um, that's found in the Bible. It's found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, that helps us to relate to Jesus Christ. Because he says he was tested in every way like humanity. He experienced our weaknesses because he went through everything that we go through as man. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, where he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. 
So I'm going to paraphrase the story. But in the wilderness, he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. So by this time, Jesus is, and this is right after his baptism. This is after the celebration of um, where God says, this is my son in him. I am well pleased. And now he's in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And as a man, he's tired. He is hungry. He's hot. He's dehydrated. He's he's experiencing the needs um, that we would all face if we were in exactly the same situation. And this is where Lucifer capitalizes on his weak state, his weakened state, um, where he's tired and hungry. And this is where um, this is exactly where Satan will tries to break him. As he always tries to break us. Because before I even start, let's think about when darkness plagues us. It's not in the times of spiritual revival. It's not in the times where things are so good and things are going great. It's times of trial. It's times of struggles. It's probably changes or or challenges in our circumstances or experiences in life that impact us. Where it brings us into a place where Satan capitalizes and leverages on our weakness and then plagues us in that spot. In the same situation, this is where Jesus is. And in there's three times that Satan attempts to break Jesus or to tempt him or test him to make him fall to temptation and to sin. The first one is where he Satan notices that Jesus is hungry and he and he says, "Here, turn this stone into bread." The test here is Satan's wanting Jesus to rely on self. It's to make it about him, to, to gratify, to, for self-gratification. And I want you to think about the challenges that you face. When you go through a struggle, when you go through weaknesses, or when you feel that you're in a weak spot in your life, we have the tendency or we may have the desire to medicate or soothe. You know, um, whether that's binge eating, whether that's, um, you know, uh, there are so many things that we can do, you know, where we become addicted to things, you know, addicted to substances, addicted to things to try and medicate us um, to soothe the problem, to soothe us from the problem that we're dealing with. So in this sense, Satan's trying to leverage um, Christ's weakness and his hunger and says, here, don't rely on God. Don't trust in your heavenly father. Here, take this stone and turn it into bread and gratify the desires of the flesh or gratify yourself. And then the second temptation. So I'm going to explain the temptations first, and then I'm going to explain how Jesus has victory over these temptations or these tests. The second test is where uh, Satan brings him to a cliff. And he says, throw yourself off the cliff and then call upon the angels and prove that God will save you or prove that your angels save you. So your feet don't touch the stone. In this way, what Satan is trying to do is encourage Jesus to abandon the will of God. So basically what what Satan's trying to incept or place a thought in Jesus's mind to say, God isn't who he says he is. God isn't the one that's going to protect you. God isn't the one that's going to save you. So you know what? You're better off. If you were to cast yourself off this cliff, you're better off saving yourself. So prove that you have the power to save yourself. So the first one was to medicate. The second one, this first, the first test was for Jesus to medicate. The second test was for Jesus to separate. And what I mean by separate is separate from God to go and go rogue and do his own plan and do his own will. How often do we do that because of the circumstances that we're in and the challenges that we might be facing because of finance, because of um, ill health, because of challenges, because of relationship issues, how, how easy it, it is for us to go rogue and trust in our own will and trust in our own feelings and judgments and not be led by God, not be led by our father in heaven who loves us, but to actually go and deviate from the path. And that's exactly what Satan's trying to do with Jesus here. He's trying to separate. 
made Jesus question God's identity, question God's, um, his heavenly father's um, intent for him to make him think, does God really care about my well-being? And then the third test is when Satan leads him to this, um, this high place and shows him all of this splendor. And he says, all of this can be yours. All of this can be yours if only you bow to me. And this is for Jesus. The test was for Jesus. And Satan, sorry, Satan was trying to encourage him to worship false gods. And the reason why I say it's false gods or worship deceit is simply because everything that Jesus, um, everything that Satan showed Jesus was already Jesus's to begin with. The almighty, mighty creator, there is nothing that Jesus does not own and have dominion over. Yet Satan, in his deception, tries to deceive Jesus to say, all of this can be yours if only you bow down to me. So he was trying to um, encourage Jesus to be led by his feelings because Jesus is tired. Jesus is hungry. And he's trying to move Jesus away from relying and trusting on his heavenly father. And then, and actually making him believe or worship Satan instead, or bow down to another God, a false God. And so the first one, the first test was encouraging Jesus to medicate. The second test was encouraging Jesus to separate. And the third one was encouraged to, um, encouraging Jesus to eliminate, to eliminate his faith in his heavenly father and to rely more on his feelings by bowing down and making false, um, by bowing down to a false God. How often do we do that? How often do, well, I'm going to speak for myself here. There was a big season of my life where I relied on self. And because I didn't trust God, simply because I didn't know him, I didn't have a reliance on him. And so I didn't think that he had my best interest at heart. So what I would do is it's like, well, you know, if you want something done right, you do it yourself. And so I walked to the beat of my own drum. And I relied on myself. I relied on my finances. I relied on my abilities. And I ultimately put myself on the altar because I felt that I was the only one that cared for me. I was the only one that had like that noticed the value in me. It was all based on self. And it was all driven on by not confidence or arrogance. It was driven by unworthiness and insecurity because I was scared. Because I wouldn't want to put myself out there to be loved by other people because of the fear of rejection, the fear of not being enough. So I thought, well, it's better if I do it myself. So I ended up worshipping the God of money. I ended up worshipping the God of self. And I eliminated my faith. I didn't have faith in God. So the three things that Satan tried to do was um, encourage Jesus to medicate, to separate and to eliminate. And how often does that happen in our lives? How often does Satan in our dark places or in our dark times or our times of struggle, in our times of challenge, he says, don't worry, you know, just medicate. Just go to that website that you, you, know, you know you're not you're not wanting to go to because afterwards you don't feel satisfied, you feel shame, you feel guilt. But yeah, you just go just because you want that instant gratification. Or where, whether it's, you know, don't rely on God. You know, when it says trust in the Lord with all your heart, lead not on your own understanding, don't worry about that. Just do it yourself. Because, you know, if you want something done right, do it yourself. You know, in those times where Satan tries to leverage, you know, our weaknesses in our dark times, he's saying to us, just separate, just separate from God. And then the third one, he's saying, well, what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in God? Because you don't need to do that. And he's encouraging us to eliminate our faith in God totally. And in all those three things, that's where, that's where I can say, that's where it says this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he, he faced all of the same things we did. There is everything that Jesus went through, we've gone through, but everything we've gone through, all our struggles, we know that he experienced as well. And he did that because he loves us. He did that so he can empathize with us. But he did that to show hope that there was victory and the victory found, was found in him. So I'm going to share with you how the victory was found in him. The first thing, it was through all, through all these things, 
Christ remained faithful. Now that's the key word that I want to celebrate today. God's faithfulness to us. So Jesus was faithful. Because there's a response when um, Satan tempted him with the stone, with the bread, to say, hey, turn, turn this stone into bread. He said, man cannot live on bread alone. And so what he did was he relied on God. Man cannot live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the word of God. And he's saying, I know what God says about me. I know what the scriptures say. I know what God has declared over my life. And so my the way that I am, I'm okay because my heavenly father has taken care of me. In the second one, so the first one, his response was, man cannot live on bread alone. So he relied on God. The second one, when he was put up on the cliff and said, go and save yourself, he says to Jesus says to Satan, don't put God to the test. In other words, I'm not going to use God and the power of God to my uh, just for my convenience. He's not a genie and I'm not going to treat him as such. He's my loving heavenly father. And so I'm not going to capitalize on the power that he's given me for my own selfish gain. No, no, no. I trust that God knows me. My heavenly father knows me, loves me, cares for me. And his will for my life is to give me victory. And so I'm going to trust in that. He knew who his father was. There was no question of the, the identity of his loving heavenly father. Let us be reminded and let's, let us celebrate that we can have that victory as well. Because we can sh shout and we can celebrate that Jesus Christ, that our heavenly father loves us, that he wants what's best for us, that he's cared for us abundantly. He loves his children. And the third and final test he said, when, when, when uh, Satan said, hey, all of this could be yours, all Jesus had to do before he did the almighty mic drop was away from me, Satan, for it says, no, you should have no other God but God, but the one true God, my heavenly father. So what did he have? He had ultimate unconditional faith in his heavenly father. And that's what he's given us. The devil is a one trick pony. Let me, let me say that again. The devil is a one trick pony and uses the same tactics on us just in different flavors. But there is hope because all of those ways, if you looked at them, he all in our dark times or in the darkness, he tells us to medicate. He encourages us to separate and he tries to make us eliminate, eliminate our faith in God. But there is victory. And where is the victory found? The victory is found in Jesus Christ. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter two, verse uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse two. And this is what uh, this is a very powerful um, verse that helps me understand how Jesus was able to have victory, because a lot of the times we can say, oh, well, because he was God. Like when he was man, he was man and he was a fully man, fully God. So it was easy for him to have victory over Satan. But when he was man, this is what the, um, the passage specifically says. And I want you to pay very close attention to this. It says, we, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. How can we have victory? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. In other versions, in the NIV, it says, now let us look towards Jesus, who was the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Because the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place um, of honor beside God's throne. He's seated at the right hand of God. What I love about this statement is, let us be reminded that he, it was because of his perfect faith that gave him victory. His perfect faith gave him perfect, perfect deeds. Right? He had perfect power because of his perfect trust and reliance in God. That's what he had. That's what God has given us. And that's what gives us victory. Because when Jesus says, you know, faith, faith is what's going to sustain, right? Faith in God. We're going to move on. And this is how we're going to claim victory in Jesus. And there's three things that I want us to remember. And the three statements of this are these. He did it for us. He's always with us and he's totally got us. So when we're in our times of darkness, when we're in our places of bondage, when we're in our, when we feel enslaved to the circumstances or we're going through the spiritual warfare, I want us to be reminded that Jesus, he did it for us. He's always with us and he's totally got us. So we're going to look at the first one. Jesus 
Jesus was victorious. It was Jesus that was victorious. He did it for us. There's a Bible passage we're going to look at, and it's found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. We're going to go through these three statements, and in each statement, I'm going to claim victory in Jesus. So I'm going to take a moment now and I want you to open up your heart to the spirit. I want you to open up your heart to the spirit and the leading of God to say, potentially, if you're in a place of darkness, if you're in a place of or a circumstance that makes you feel trapped or in a place where you or a season of life where you're constantly in a struggle or you, you're constantly feeling caged and you're like, I need freedom. I need to be set free by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. After every um, every one of these um, statements, I'm going to pray and I'm just going to claim a promise. And if that, if that relates to you or if you can resonate with that, I want you to say amen in the group chat. I want to get some hype in the group chat because we're going to claim spiritual deliverance. We're going to claim um, victory in Jesus today for every one of us here. So the first one um, we're going to look at is Jesus was victorious. He was the one that did it for us. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 25. He defeated sin and death once and for all. This is what the passage said. And he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like the high priests here on earth who enter the most holy place year after year with the blood of the animal. And that was um, the ceremonial law that helped um, the, the Israelites. Um, it helped as a type pointing to Jesus Christ and what he had accomplished. In verse 26, it says, if that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once and for all, once and for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. The key statement that I want to highlight in this passage is it says, but now, once and for all time, Jesus didn't have to die continuously over and over again. He did it once and once for all time. He did it for all of our sin. If we link this with Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, He canceled the record of the charges against us, all the charges against us, and took, away the, took it all away by nailing it to the cross. And I want you to think for a moment, right? I want you to think about the struggles. I want you to think about the sin. I want you to think about, you know, the, 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 the behaviors that you're doing, that you're thinking to yourself, this shouldn't be where I am. Uh, like, you know, if I celebrate Jesus, why am I still doing this? Or why am I still going down these paths? Why do I still feel that I'm chained and, and, and still in the same bondage? Let me reassure you that the sin that you've committed, the sin that you've, you're committing, and the sin that you will potentially commit, God has taken every single one of those because the love that he has for you, the love that he has for humanity, he has taken every single one of those and has nailed them to the cross. So, and for me, I lived a big portion of my life with shame and guilt, carrying the burden of sin, carrying the burden of my unworthiness because the sins that I was or the sin cycle that I was currently in where I would sin, I would make a mistake. I would try and be, you know, remorseful and guilty and I'll try and work my way back into good, God's good graces until I stumbled the next time. And that would cause even more guilt and put me in a rut of just shame. And then at the end of the day, even when I surrendered it to God, I felt so like not even genuine in doing it because I just thought, well, I'm just sin waiting to happen over and over again. Let me reassure you, as the scriptures have said, you're not holding on to anything. You're not carrying anything because Jesus took everything because he loves you and he nailed it to the cross. So believe that you're holding on to nothing. Believe that he has let, he has taken it. He's asked you to let it go and he's nailed it to the cross. Know that whatever you're struggling with, Jesus has already, or Jesus has already saved you from it. I'm going to repeat that. Know that whatever you are struggling with, Jesus has already saved you from it. You are holding on to nothing because he's nailed it to the cross. So I'm going to pray now. And I want to claim, I claim in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that he has broken every chain that has kept 
you you me any of us in bondage so i'm going to say a quick word of prayer and then we're going to go into the next step into the next statement so lord i just want to pray a pray of victory over every um person here Lord, thank you for breaking every chain. Thank you for setting us all free so we can walk in freedom, that we're no longer in bondage because your sacrifice, because your love for us, because you defeated death through your sacrifice and your resurrection, you've given us new life. You've given us hope. So Lord, I pray and I claim the freedom that's found in your mighty name. I claim the new life that's found in your life. And Lord, I just pray that anyone here who is who is in bondage right now, that you break those chains. I claim victory over them. I claim victory over their lives so they can be set free and they can celebrate freedom found in you. I ask this all in your mighty name. Amen. If that was you, if you feel, if you, cl- if you can claim that you have been set free by Jesus Christ, I want you to say amen. If you feel that you have let go of the things that you were carrying, that you feel you needed to let go and you've been reminded that they're no longer there in your hands because he nailed them to the cross 2000 plus years ago. I want you to say, amen. You are living in freedom because of what he's already accomplished. He did it for us. He's always with us and he's totally got us. So let's go on to the next one. He's always with us. We are united with him. He is always with us. There's a passage found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. This has set me free because there was a big portion of my life that made me feel that though I had given it to God, I still felt dirty. I still felt corrupt. I still felt that there was always going to be this perpetual darkness in my life and in me. And I just thought, well, of course, I'm going to be sin waiting to happen. I'm just going to be this mistake over and over again because this corruption is still remaining in me. May this passage be a word of hope and a word of victory over your life. Colossians chapter 9 verse 12. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. And this is it. So you also are complete through your union with Christ who is the head of every ruler and every authority over every spiritual authority, even the ones that are feeding lies into your mind to saying to say you're still ruled by the darkness, that you're still a slave to sin, that God hasn't set you free. He's the ruler and the authority over that. So you have been complete in Jesus Christ. Verse 11. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised by not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. That's powerful because basically Jesus is saying is I've cleaned you. I've cleansed you because of my sacrifice and because you are united with my sacrifice. And because of my resurrection, you are created brand new. And when I say brand new, there is no corruption in you. You have been made fully clean in the power by the blood of Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus Christ, celebrate that you are clean. He cut away that sinful nature. So if you feel, oh, I'm still this dirty, corrupted darkness. Jesus said, no, that's deceit. Don't buy into the lie of that one trick pony where Satan is saying that you are still broken, that you still are a mess, that you will always be a slave. No, no, no. Be set free by Jesus Christ. Allow him to remind you that you are united with him and he has given you the power to claim victory over those challenges, over those circumstances. Verse 12. Um, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized and with him you were raised in new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God. Your trust in God, your faith in God, that's where the power is. Who raised Christ from the dead. Know that you are never alone in this battle. The battle never belonged to you in the first place. It's his battle, so give it to him. So the spiritual warfare will continue. The test and the temptations will come. But Jesus Christ says, take heart. I've overcome the world. So the battle belongs to the Lord. So give God your battles. Because that's there's a song that says, this is how I fight my battles. Basically, give it all to Jesus Christ. 
Jesus take the wheel. I surrender all. That's where we can claim that Jesus is victorious because he's saying all the burdens, all the battles, all the challenges, they're mine, not yours. Give them to me so I can live in complete freedom, knowing that my heavenly father loves me and he's given me a champion in Jesus Christ to give me victory over my battles. So claim that in God's powerful name. I'm going to pray again. I claim in the loving name of Jesus that he is my guardian and he will give me victory in all of my battles. If that's you, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I claim victory in your name over everyone here who is struggling, who is feeling that they're not enough, who are, who's feeling that the struggle, it belongs to them, who is feeling that say, it's just them against Satan or them against the demons that they're facing and them against the circumstances. But may they be reminded that in Jesus' mighty name that you are the one that walks on the storms you when we think that we're going to sink you're the one that carries us and makes us walk on the things that we should have drowned in so may we claim that victory today may we walk in the victory that's found in you and may we re be reminded that the battle belongs to you so we can claim victory because you've taken care of those battles i ask this in your mighty name amen so that's so he did it for us He's always with us. Sorry, I'm starting to sweat. Oh man, I'm feeling so hype about this. If that prayer was for you and you're feeling the victory found in Jesus or you're claiming the victory found in Jesus, knowing that every single battle is won because you've given it to him. Let me see. Let me see the amens. Let me see the chats. The, uh, let me see the, the, the hype in the chat. The third, the third point we're going to look at. So the, the three so far, he did it for us. He's always, he's always with us. He's totally got us. Let me go to the, before we go to the third point, I want to share with you this, this game that's being released soon. And if you're a Mario fan, throw it in the chat. Tell me your favorite character in, in Mario. For me personally, I was a big fan of Luigi. And then um, I also became a fan of, uh, what's his name? Uh, Yoshi. Big fan of Yoshi, um, especially Mario Kart. He had good turning. He had great uh, drifting. Wasn't big fan of like uh, the big guys like Koopa and um, Donkey Kong because when it came to Mario Kart and stuff like that, they were like they had good handling, but they were just slow. I think Yoshi for me personally was an all rounder. Luigi had has some good drifting on him, um, but yeah, for for me it was either it, it was always either Yoshi or was a mushroom man or toadstool guy like the, the mushroom dude anyway so there's a new game coming out called mario party jamboree now this is like a culmination of all different mario parties that have happened um uh, of the franchise and so they've got a collection of old mario challenges and new mario challenges um in the party style game so there was this one and um, uh, there's this one that I remember and it's like there's this the way that you use the switch or the controller is that you need to wind it right and it and it kind of generates the power and then the, uh, and it kind of fills up the meter and then the meter kind of yeah you you win whoever fills up the meter first and um, this is what's crazy because I would just do this but like um, I would have to but I would always lose because I noticed my friends that would change the the techniques of the way that they do it so instead of doing the the winding this way they they do the, those ones so I just want you to so when it comes to Mario Party or the you know the those kind of things I just want you to throw in the chat what your favorite fun game was um, whether it was the race or whether yeah just throw it in there just so I can get a get an idea of what what uh, your favorite one was we're talking about um, well, Mario Party Jamboree is going to be going to be launched. I think quite soon, and there's been a few reviews so far, and so I've had a look at the reviews, and um, there's one key thing that's kind of making it new. So it's not just uh, new maps and new games, but there's a new feature in there, and this is something that was really interesting because that re this really speaks into what we're talking about today. It, there's a new feature called allies slash buddies or allies or buddies and the way that it works is that there are key token characters that you can um, have alliance with along the way so if you if you stumble upon them and you have I think um, a certain amount or you've done a certain achievement and you connect with them on the map just say it's Princess Peach you become Princess Peach's ally and then she works with you 
um, uh, for a season of time in the game. Now, the way that she works with you is that they, they she gives you, well, that, that character, that ally or buddy gives you power-ups. They give you um, like double what you would usually get. So just say, for example, you win or you achieve um, a star. If you're with an ally, then you're doubled up. So you can get double stars and that's super powerful. And that basically gives you an unfair advantage um, in the game. But it, it's got its limitations because in the game, like not only do you have double of the great stuff, but you also have the double of the bad stuff. So if you lose out, you lose double. So if you have you you don't have coins or you lose a certain amount of coins, you lose double the amount of coins. Also, if you get overtaken some way in 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 the level, that ally then abandons you and goes to the new champion. So it, the game kind of makes it quite challenging and quite fun by throwing into this in this ally. But I want to specifically talk about the context of this ally in what we're talking about. If we're playing the game of life and we have the ally and our ally is Jesus Christ, he has given us an unfair advantage, right? But that's a good thing to have because that automatically puts us in a position that we win at life. And that's what Jesus is telling us that we've accomplished because of him. He said because of what he's done, we win. Right? The battle belongs to the Lord, but God is victorious, so we win. We can claim victory because Jesus is taking care of us. So in this game, in the game of life, there's a few things that we need to know when it comes to Jesus as our ally. It's an unfair advantage because the, if the battle belongs to the Lord, He is always going to be victorious. We just need to trust that He's taking care of it and He will take care of it. Why? Because He did it for us. He's always with us and He's totally got us. So he's already, he's, he's done it for us and he's with us. He's our ally. We can't be separated from him. He will never separate from us. That's the thing in the game, the, the ally will just jump ship and go to someone else. Jesus is saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you till the very end because I've got you. So take it like be encouraged that Jesus as our ally, we have certain victory. We have an unfair advantage over the battles that we face because Jesus has already claimed victory. So what we need to do is claim victory in Jesus's name. Let me hear you say amen. So he did it for us. He's always with us and he's totally got us. Final point. We are victorious because he's totally got us. There's a passage found in Romans chapter 8 verse 15 to 17. It's the same spirit that gave Jesus victory lives in us. And this is what the passage says. So you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are children of God. And since we are, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. And it ends like that, but it gives me encouragement to say the battle isn't over because Satan is still around. Temptation is still around. We still get tested. We still go through trials. We still go through struggles. I went through one today. And a personal experience of mine is that Jesus, uh, I... Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my conqueror. Jesus is victorious. But boy, does Satan know how to plague my mind. Boy, does he know how to send an onslaught of feelings, negative thoughts and lies into my mind so I can feel a certain way about myself. I, this afternoon, I was really struggling with intolerance and I, I just couldn't understand why. And it was simply, and I thought to myself, well, if Satan, if I actually buckled, Right. If I actually said, well, I'm going to I'm going to throw in the towel, I'm going to medicate, I'm going to separate, I'm going to eliminate. Then Satan would have won. And I knew that that's what Satan wanted me to do. And he made me believe in my feelings. He made me be dictated by my feelings. And boy, was that hard. But then praise the Lord that I gave the battle to him. I can preach right now. I can share this message with you as a living, breathing testimony of the victory found in Jesus Christ. Not because I felt it, because I claimed it through faith. 
right? I praise the Lord that I had a loving wife who prayed over me, who saw the struggle that I was facing, who saw me in spiritual warfare. Because I said, I don't know why. I, there should be no reason why I'm feeling this way, but I am. And it's because Satan was having a field day trying to break me. And praise the Lord, she prayed over me. Praise the Lord that God Squad Church is a community that we will pray for each other, that we will support one another, that we can claim victory in Jesus Christ over each other's lives. So I praise the Lord that we can celebrate in His glory because during the time of suffering, we can support one another and we can, have, we can claim victory in Jesus' name in our lives as well during our time of testing, during our time of trials. Because we can take heart because he has overcome the world. There's a final passage and this gives me hope. This gives me hope to the place of confidence, not arrogance, but confidence. Where you can, you know, have you ever had a confidence strut where you can feel that you're on top of the world? That you can actually celebrate victory? This is what, this is what it is. It's Jude chapter 1 verse 24. And I want you to hear what it says. It says, now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glory and presence without a single fault. This is what's beautiful about it. In another version, it says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. He has set us free. We're no longer caged. We're no longer in bondage. We're no longer in chains. He is the chain breaker. He is the bondage. He is the, he is the way maker. And we can celebrate that. And here it gives us assurance that he says now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. What I love about that passage is that it reminds us that we are not mistakes ready, waiting to happen. That we are not anticipated sin. That God has said I've taken care of it. Therefore Romans chapter 6 verse 11 or Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Therefore consider yourself dead to and free from sin. Not because of what we do but what, because of what Christ has already accomplished in, for and through us. He did it for us. He's always with us. He's totally got us. God believes that about you. He made a way. He was the one that made a way. He declares it over your life. We believe it and we walk in it. What would, my brothers and sisters, what would God Squad Church look like if we were all constantly living in the freedom found in Jesus Christ? knowing that he did it for us, that he's always with us, and that he's totally got us. Well, my brothers and sisters, we don't have to imagine that. Because of the faith that God has given us, we can actually claim it, we can believe it, and we can celebrate it. So others who may not know Jesus, who may not know about his love, not, who may not know about his mercy, his compassion, his grace, his abundant life, or the eternal life that's found in him, for those who, the, of the, for the people who may not know him but are in desperate need of him because of the darkness that they're surrounded in, they also can have that hope. They also can have the, the good news that he also did it for them, that he is also with them, and that he's also totally got them as well. Let's claim Jesus. Let's claim victory in Jesus because he has defeated darkness once and for all as we close in a word of prayer. Let's claim that promise once and for all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much that today has been a day of spiritual deliverance, of spiritual revival, of healing, of grace, of love, and of victory. Lord, thank you for defeating darkness once and for all. Thank you for reminding us that it's because of you and what you have, you've accomplished that we can walk in freedom and in your light. Thank you that you took care of it for us. Thank you that we are now, because we are united with you, because of our faith, because of the faith that God has given us to trust in you, we know that we're not alone in our struggles. We know that we're not alone in the times of trial. We know that in this world there will be trials, but we can take heart because you have overcome the world. Thank you for reminding us that we are united with you and we can walk forward each and every day knowing that there is hope, knowing that there is victory and that victory is found in you. So Lord, I pray that that is the overflow of our lives into our communities. So others who may not know you, but are in desperate need of you can, can claim victory um, in your name over their darkness. Thank you for defeating darkness once, once and for all. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Much love. Peace out. God bless.